The miracle that we carry around on our shoulders, the human brain, is really a vast electrical system. The wiring of the system is driven by two forces, genetics, or perhaps more importantly, experience. The basic unit of this electrical system is a brain cell, or a neuron. A neuron is composed of a cable-like structure called an axon, with branches at the end called dendrites. If two neurons are wired together, then a small electrical charge is allowed to pass from the axon of one neuron to the dendrite of another. Ultimately, these neurons form vast and complex circuits. Some circuits regulate body temperature and heart rate, while other circuits enable us to figure out mathematics problems or compose music. When a baby arrives in the world, that baby arrives with about 100 billion neurons. Each one of those neurons has, on average, about 10,000 dendrites. That means the possible number of connecting points in a newborn baby's brain is about one quadrillion connections. However, at birth, only about 17% of those connections have been made. The vast majority, the other 83%, will be wired together in the days, the weeks, the months, the years, and now we know even the decades that follow. As I mentioned earlier, the wiring of a baby's brain is driven by the constant interplay between two powerful forces. The first is genetics, what I like to think of as the hard wiring. The other is the baby's experiences, the soft wiring. <laughs> Language acquisition is a clear example of the difference between hard and soft wiring. As I'm sure everyone is well aware, we don't need to teach babies how to make noise. Babies arrive in the world genetically endowed, hardwired, with the ability to vocalize. However, which of the 6,500 languages of the world that baby will end up speaking is not hardwired? That's the soft wiring. Neuro connections shaped by the experiences that that child will have. Neuroscientists have a phrase to capture the phenomenon of soft wiring. The neurons that fire together, wire together. The more they fire together, the stronger the connection becomes. However, some experiences have a greater impact than others. The experiences that have the greatest impact on the wiring of the child's brain are those that happen during a brain's growth spurts. During growth spurts, dendrites at the end of the neuron grow like crazy, a process called blossoming. If during this time a child's experience causes a neuron to fire, these new dendrites will get wired into circuits with other neurons. The dendrites that don't fire will wither back and die. This process is called pruning. So during growth spurts, the brain is extremely sensitive to experience. During this period of brain growth, it is experience that will determine which connections get made or blossom, and which do not, and prune back. Until very recently, we thought that all of the brain's growth spurts were done by about the age of 8 to 10. The latest research, however, shows that even though the adolescent brain doesn't increase in size, it is still a series of major construction zones, a work in progress. And when we understand what those growth spurts are, we can begin to answer the question, why do they act that way? One of the major construction zones in the teenage brain is right behind the forehead, just above the eyebrows, an area technically known as the prefrontal cortex, or what I like to call the brain's supervisor. It's the part of the brain that helps us to think ahead, consider consequences, manage emotional impulses and urges. That's a major construction zone in the teenage brain, which is why teenagers can often be impulsive, risk-taking, and quick to anger. Now couple that with the fact that the emotional centers of the brain, anger for example, are in high gear. If we were to compare the teenage brain to an automobile, it's as if the gas pedals to the floor and the brakes are on back order. Considering what we now know about the development of a child's brain, that its wiring is largely determined by events experienced well into adolescence, 
we can begin to understand how important it is for us to foster experiences that are positive and not negative. That's what makes the job of parenting so important. That's what makes the job of childcare, of teaching so important. These folks provide major input into the experiences that children will have during their formative years. And in the modern world, a major source of experience for children is the media. They take the form of television, video games, computers, the internet, iPods, cell phones. These various forms of media have become a major source of experience. So it's our job to make sure that these experiences are positive and that these media experiences play just a role, not the dominant role in children's lives.